Welcome to Murfreesboro Storyteller, a program emanating this month from the headquarters of the Rutherford County Archives. And we're pleased to welcome our guest, John Lodel, who is Rutherford County Archivist. Yes, thank you. John, uh, how long have you been in this position for Rutherford County? Uh, the archives and myself, we came together in August of uh, 2006. So we've okay. been here, both of us have been here almost 10 years. 10 years. Tell us, what, what is archivist or what are the archives mean? What does that whole retain provide for the community? Well, we're 100% part of county government. Okay. So uh, we're one of the departments of the county government. So our job is to keep all the permanent records of county government. And permanent means, you know, legal historical records of the county, uh, of the people of this county. So our job is to keep the older marriage records, wills, okay. uh, property records, not the deeds, but the, the tax records. Um, we keep uh, all the different court records, and that's a uh, vast number of courts in this county. Okay, so everything from to civil to here. criminal to probate courts to uh, drug court, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we also keep uh, some uh, birth and death records, uh, things of that sort. Uh, and these records, these are the permanent records. So this county formed in 1804. So most of our records go back to 1804. We never had a major courthouse fire. So that's our job is to keep all these records indefinitely. If an attorney working on a case needs to uh, do some research on a particular event or happening or legal uh, development in years past, will they come here or do they go to the county offices for that? Uh, most people will go to the county offices first for mm -hmm. more recent contemporary issues. And if the record is old enough, then the courts or the county office will send them down here to retrieve those records because okay. we're the repository. So, um, you know, we don't have to deal with the, the legalities of, uh, yeah. uh, of, of the records, but we do keep the records as a repository so they do come down here and, and they can sit down and do research here. I recently had to provide a copy of my marriage license of all things. <laughs> <laughs> but it went to the county clerk's office and she provided exactly it, it depends on which office um, how recent the records are mm -hmm. are sent to the archives so for example a marriage record um, the newest marriage record i have is 1940 uh, but the newest chancery court record i have is 2003 so it really depends on what what office mm -hmm. um, uh, how, how soon we get the records mm -hmm. Tell me about John Lodel. Uh, what brought you to <laughs> Rutherford County, if you will? Well, I was born and raised in Nashville, okay. and like many, many people, came to MTSU sure. and never left. Wonderful. You know, Murfreesboro is this awesome place in America that uh, you just, you come here and don't want to leave, right? So, so true. <laughs> we hear that over and over. So I had a, a fortunate opportunity to go through the, uh, the graduate history program at MTSU, specifically in public history, where MTSU's uh, training the next generation of archivists and museum professionals and historic preservationists. Um, so a after that, I had the opportunity to work at a couple places in town, uh, Sam Davis Home in Smyrna oh, as okay. director for a couple years. And then I was over at Bradley Academy Museum back mm -hmm. in the day as director for a little over a year. Um, and then the, when the county uh, built this building, they actually added a position, director of the archives, and I was able to apply and, and luckily got lucky to get oh, a job. Oh, a perfect fit for it. Oh, oh I, I love it. And uh, I think I'm doing a good job here trying to do my best. How large is your facility or how many square feet? Uh, good question. The, the building is 10,000 square square feet of that the record storage is half 5,000 square feet are you daily receiving additions to the archives uh, not literally daily but yes on, on every year we bring in another uh, series of records uh, okay. from all, all the counties all the um, offices in the county so uh, at any given time we're pulling in court records or property tax records things like that um, <clears throat> you know the, the nature of an archive is you got to look to the future we always have to expand and that's one thing the county's looking at right now the opportunity to hopefully expand this building to okay. give us a little more more storage uh, the golden question we always get is why are we keeping all this paper and the <laughs> we're now in the digital age it's 2016 yes. uh -huh. but we're starting to keep paper and there's there's good reasons for that um, uh, some of it's historical based. We have records from marriage records from 1804. Mm. I don't think the citizens of the county want us to go out and shred those, even I though they've not. been yeah. scanned. Yeah. Uh, so some things are, are important to our important to our history. Other things, um, because state law tells us we cannot oh, destroy okay. the original okay. hard copies. Um, so uh, sheriff inmate files, for example, are something that we have to have the hard copy original. Although they are scanned, we still have to have the paper copy for now. That may change in the future. And there's a, a lot of the court records, um, not all of them, but a lot of the court records, we still have to have the hard copy, although we're scanning them in. Okay. Uh, the digital version is great for quick access, fingertips sure. of the computer, there you go. But the paper copy is something we can keep for 200 years. Uh, a lot of things that we scan and digitize, um, that's great for speeding up access to it, 
but not necessarily great for preserving it forever mm. because computers become obsolete so quick. True. So these things that we put into the cloud today, mm -hmm. that cloud may start raining 20 years from now and mm. it won't be there. Yeah. So, um, so right now it's paper copies. All that to say the county is moving forward uh, into the digital world. Mm -hmm. um, we are starting to take things, what we call born digital. So starting to file court records, for example, that we don't have a paper trail on. And they start out digital. They right? start out digital. Yeah. And we can microfilm those. We can go straight from computer to microfilm. Mm. Um, so a lot of people are wondering why we even microfilm this day and age. And that is still the preservation standard for backing up the hard copy or backing up computer digital copies. Microfilm, uh, as antiquated as that sounds, you know, a little film, roll of mm. film um, is still a preservation standard. That roll of film today, the, the, the technology used to keep that roll of film or make that roll of film is, is 500 year lifespan. Um, mm. So that roll of film, it, and there again, it's just a backup. It's an emergency backup. If, if our computers crash somehow and we couldn't retrieve the information off the computers, or God forbid this building got hit by a tornado, we have a backup. And that microfilm is kept off-site. It's usually sent to Nashville and put into uh, storage. Okay. And you've been serving as an adjunct professor for the MTSU Department of History, I believe. Yes, exactly. So I graduated from MTSU in uh, August of 2004 and have been adjuncting the History Department since then. And it's, it's my side gig. This is my main job, you know, working sure. at the county archives. But luckily, the, the county and MTSU has many wonderful partnerships, and ours is one of those. Mm -hmm. I'm the only official county uh, employee here or county staff here at the archives, uh, but I do have two graduate students from MTSU um, and they are assigned to me uh, to the archives and uh, they come in and, and help me keep with the with the day-to-day -day operations. And while we're on it, what are your hours of operation? We are here Monday through Friday 8.30 to 4. All right, good. John, you mentioned in our previous discussion that we wanted want to talk some about the bottoms area. Yeah. I guess so many people in our community have no idea what the bottoms is or was. Exactly. Uh, the city right now has an initiative to um, redevelop what we call the bottoms. Mm -hmm. The bottoms is a, the, the low land uh, on today, which is Broad Street. Uh, basically Broad Street running through town from roughly West Main Street down to Church Street, maybe as far as Discovery Center even, if it could be included. And I also recall, recall it being between Vine and Broad. What is yeah, Vine, Broad? And, Vine and Broad yeah. Street. So, uh, and, and Broad Street on both sides. Um, yes, so, yes, um, I didn't mean to explain. <laughs> if, if you look at a map of Murfreesboro, if you have an opportunity to look at a historic map of Murfreesboro, you'll see a perfect grid coming off the square where the, the, where the, line, where the streets are perpendicular to okay. each other and making square lots. Uh, Broad Street cuts a diagonal through that, yes. and a lot of people wonder why that happened. And it was just an extension of the main road through town in the 1950s. That was a redevelopment um, of the area, wasn't it? it was part of it. Exactly. So the bottoms originally, uh, originally coming out of the Civil War, the bottoms was an area that a former slave, former enslaved people, uh, now free free persons were uh, were finding housing. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was low. It literally flooded anytime we had two inches of rain, um, which was multiple times a year. And many um, of those houses were built on stilts, as I recall. Uh, they were raised. Some of them were raised up. Some of some, them weren't. No, yeah, so, not all of them were. So yeah. when it rained, they got flooded yeah, out. Right, huh. And so it was a less desirable area, but it was also an area that uh, these uh, former enslaved people with no opportunity, all of a sudden could find opportunity. Mm -hmm. They were also close to the industrial area of the town, historically, right, right. there by the railroad, mm -hmm. the cotton gins, cotton all gins, the, all the yes, working uh -huh. areas. Uh, so these were working people. Mm -hmm. uh, at first, it was predominantly African American, but by the 1940s and 50s, it was a mixture, uh, mm -hmm. maybe even as much as 50-50 or close, uh, poor white, poor African Americans mm -hmm. uh, by stereotype. Um, now, what happened in the 1950s was a national trend for urban renewal. There was federal dollars available coming out of World War II to help cities get rid of quote unquote urban blight. And these tended to be areas that um, city officials thought were blighted. Um, a lot of times it was true, they, didn't have, they did not have running water in the bottoms. Mm -hmm. uh, they had very little electricity. I talked to one uh, gentleman who lived, who grew up in the bottoms and he said they had a two room shack with a light bulb hanging down and that was the, the electricity in the house, you know, and no running water. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there was definitely some um, undesirable conditions by 1950s for housing and living and health uh, that the, the federal dollars were able to build, uh, to get rid of those areas, to come in with urban renewal and to build what today we call project housing, right. which was in the 1950s and 60s, ahead of its time, you know, sure. a, a brick structure with indoor plumbing and electricity. Franklin Heights, which is now being changed to another usage, uh, 
uh, the housing out along Mercury Boulevard were examples of that. Exactly, the, and the third one there behind Oakland's Historic yes, Housing behind Museum. behind Oakland, right. Um, we're, all, we're all examples of that. And I found also examples of a lot of the folks living in, in the bottoms were relocated to other areas rather than to the public housing available. Too. Exactly, it wasn't one for one, they moved them yeah. out of the bottoms into the public housing, mm -hmm. but public housing was offered as an alternative. I recall, uh, John, in years gone by for African Americans, and I guess white as well, uh, there was a place called Mink Slide off of the public square. You come down Maple Street to Vine, and that area generally they would uh, congregate in the morning, and folks who were needing workers for a job that day on the farm, picking cotton, whatever it might be, would know to find them there. Yes. And the way it got its name was that used to be a place where they sold furs. Mm -hmm. Mink being one of them, so it got the name of being Mink Slide. Scales Funeral Home had an office at that time right in that area. So it was a, a mix of, uh, yes. of African American and, and, and whites as well. Uh, from my research and, and records here at the archives even, um, the, the African American Business District exactly came down, today would, I guess would be South Maple, that the, the, right. the section of Maple coming off, literally down the hill off of the square. Uh -huh. um, and then the, today you hit City Hall, but originally Maple Strip kept on going. Um, and so, yes, on, on the side that there's still businesses today, um, there were, Scales Funeral Home had its start. Right. Uh, there was one or two restaurants, Pool Hall. Um, C.B. Arnett's father, although a uh, white citizen, started his uh, grocery store in the 1920s there and, 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 and meet. And then he later moved to the square. Later moved, uh, but he was, he was uh, pigeonholed in there, so to speak. Okay. Um, and then the mink slide was across the street. Today it's uh, the, the barber shop or the barber college, I believe. It, it is there. on the corner of Vine and, and South Maple. Across where the, from City the Hall. furniture store used to be. Uh, where the furniture store uh, before my time in Murfreesboro, I, I but that. I understand there was a furniture store there. And uh, mink slide, uh, I always wondered if it was a, a derogatory term, but, but in talking with the African American community, uh, whether it was derogatory originally or not, uh, there's also that the roots of, of it where they sold minks and, and other yeah, uh, right. trading went on there on Saturdays, and it was a social mech. And, and talking to Katie Wilson recently, uh, uh, one of the influential people working over at Bradley Academy, she said uh, she never saw it as a derogatory term. She goes, That's, that was the social mecca for African Americans. Oh, you met at the meat true. slot, yeah, uh -huh. uh, either as a child or as an adult, and you socialized and you went from there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of history, a lot of African American history specifically, but a lot of Murfreesboro history right yeah. in that, that little area. In later times, I remember Joe and Frank Supermarket was on the corner there of South Maple and Vine, you had okay. United Army Surplus, you had Fight Hutchinson Feed Company. Yeah. A lot of the, the businesses, that some of which have prevailed over the years and some of which have passed on. Exactly. City Hall and the library come in, what, in the early 90s? Uh, the I library, think, I believe, is 92, City Hall about the same that's time. That's about right. And uh, that, that literally changed the landscape. Sure I, mean, you, I mean, look at it today. We have this beautiful plaza and two gorgeous buildings. But that, you know, before that, back even as, the, as early, as late as the 1980s and I guess up to 1990, those streets kept going through there and you had businesses like you speak of. What changes do you see coming now through this uh, whole study the city of Murfreesboro is doing? for that area in particular. That's what I'm interested to see. The city is doing a great endeavor to, to reach out to the community, to talk to city leaders and citizens, to figure out how to redevelop mm -hmm. Broad Street. Uh, but what it really means is redeveloping, again, the bottoms area. So uh, there's, uh, it's, I see it as twofold. It's a great opportunity. Uh, luckily, they're talking to many, many folks in the community to see how to bring in to incorporate the arts, not mm -hmm. just commercial development, but the arts. Uh, and history and heritage and culture. Um, the city has recently taken over Bradley Academy Museum, not literally in the bottoms historically, but right there on the hill, if you think right. about it, looking down onto Broad Street and, and what was historically the bottoms. So there's a gr and then you have Discovery Center as the, the toe end yeah, down there on the end, uh, and Cannonsburg in the middle of mm -hmm. all that. So there's a great opportunity to incorporate our arts, history, heritage, culture for today, for our new citizens that don't know our history, but at the same time, maybe bringing that history back down through the bottoms with um, in, in, in historical signage, uh, exhibit interpretation, out, outdoor signage of some type, like uh, Dr. West and his folks have done on the square through the San Francisco Preservation. And I hadn't thought about all those different facilities in that area, how they can be brought together to really uh, show our heritage in the arts. I, I, yeah, exactly, and, and I hope, you know, as a historian, I got to speak for the side of history, I sure. hope that uh, we can continue the historic signage that has been incorporated on the square and bring it down 
through the bottoms and tell the history that been, has been paved over once and hopefully not again, mm. and uh, to bring that history and heritage back to Murfreesboro to enlighten, enlighten people with what, ha what happened. There's some great stories. Uh, Peter Jennings, 1830s, 1840s, was a, a Revolutionary War veteran, African-American, started a bakery on the square, was one of the first people to try to pipe water from Murphy Spring and Sand Springs up the hill to the square. Mm. Indoor plumbing in 1830 through My wooden goodness. pipes. It didn't work, but he yeah, tried. But he tried. So, and yeah. that's a story that a lot of people don't know. Um, and then uh, the Scales having their start. Now, everybody knows the Scales family if you've been in town any, any sure. time. But they had their start right there on the business district uh, around 1917. Um, so that's a key part of our history in our town. Yeah, growing up, one of my playmates was T90 Scales. Exactly. <laughs> you know, everybody knew T90. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and I'm not from here, and I barely knew. I, I yeah. got to meet T90. Yeah. So, this is uh, quite great, a wonderful family. Great mover and shaker, and, and everything the Scales have done throughout the generations. And, and then uh, here recently, uh, there's some people interested in the Ganaway family history. Mm. Um, there was a great photographer of the 1920s in Chicago named King Ganaway, and he was born and raised here. And That's his, the same Ganaway family was in a drug drugstore here at one time. Maybe uh, the African Stickney Griffiths and Ganaway. Uh, that right. was that was probably part of the the white. Oh, that's family right. I see what that you're, came I, through I, the generations. I, um, the uh, the African American side uh, of the story of Ganaways is uh, they had a store and a house house and store right there on the corner of Maple and Vaughn. It's actually on the side that City Hall today, but right there was an influential turn of the century. Mm. Uh, a fruit market and grocery store, mm -hmm. and uh, King Ganaway went on to Chicago in the 1920s and became very famous as a photographor. And so uh, that uh, ancestors, or excuse mm -hmm. me, descendants of that family are trying to come to town and, and bring that history to light. And that's the type of stories that we can incorporate, I think, very easily in some historical signage. And who knows what else we could do through exhibits and telling that story as part of the city sure. development of the area. You mentioned C.B. Arnett's father who had a meat market on the public square. C.B. Arnett in later years, as I'm sure you know, did a book called Main Street to Mink Slide. That's right. And he went right around the square area and, and, and uh, listed all the businesses that were there and, and the connections they had one with and another. And as much history he gave, and it was, it was about a good 67 year range that he remembered yeah, of done. history of every building on yeah. the square. Well so done. That's you a you mentioned that the black community had a newspaper at one time. Uh, yes, that's something that's uh, kind of a, a, a personal endeavor to try to find these African-American newspapers. Uh, there was a lady in town that a lot of people knew. Mm -hmm. uh, her name was Mary Ellen Vaughn. Yes. Um, she was a mover shaker in her time, maybe before her time. Uh, she right. moved to Murfreesboro around 1920 um, and did a lot for public health, public education, uh, white and black. And so therefore, there again, a lot of people knew her. Um, around 1920, she started an African-American newspaper, really marketed for the African-American community. Uh, it was called the Murfreesboro Union. Uh, she ran that paper her entire life. Uh, she passed away, if I'm correct, in 1953. Um, and for at least 10 more years, a lady by the name of Pearl Wade ran that paper. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people knew Pearl Wade and know the Wade family today. Um, Ironically enough, as long as that paper was in existence, for, for the length that paper was in existence, over 40 years, we cannot find hardly any copies of it. That's um, just amazing. And I've looked, uh, I have one copy here that got archived years ago before I came back in. And uh, we found a few at MTSU Special Collections, a few at the Tennessee State Library and Archives and their special collections. Uh, all told, I have about 12 copies for a paper that ran 40 years, and that's just unheard of. Um, these papers have to be out there somewhere. They gotta be in somebody's attic or basement. And we kind of plead to the community, if you find some Murfreesboro Union newspapers, please let us know so we can get these uh, copies preserved and microfilm for future generations. If we could find more copies of it, it would tell a beautiful story of African American history oh, for sure 40 years yeah. in this town uh -huh. Uh -huh. and help supplement the total history of this town. Any other projects you're working on or things that you'd like to have that you haven't been able to locate or, <laughs> or produce? I think we've hit most of the highlights. Uh, there again, our main job here at the County Archives is to preserve just the county records. Um, but every once in a while, we have an opportunity to reach out in the community and work with the community, work with our historic sites, work with MTSU. Um, over the past uh, uh, year or two, we've worked on a cemetery project. It wasn't our initial project, but we were able to assist people going out finding all the small family cemeteries in this county and mapping them uh, at the county level. So on the county website, you can find these cemeteries. And are there many of those? Uh, there's uh, roughly 800 little cemeteries in this county. 800. That's 800, it's hard to believe, they're everywhere. And does somebody have records of who's buried there? Uh, yeah, the Historical Society did a wonderful job and printed a book called the Rutherford County uh, Cemetery Book. Mm -hmm. uh, it was republished in 2005 by Susan Daniel, editor. 
and uh, they can find those copies at all the libraries in oh, okay. Lombo, as well as here. Um, and they could find uh, the cemeteries are in there by, alphabetically by the name of the family. Uh, cemeteries usually named by family. Yes, uh, so uh, they can find the names of the cemeteries, the location of the cemeteries, and usually the names and dates off the tombstones in those cemeteries. Was there a period when they trans, not transferred, but changed from having family graveyards to community graveyards like Evergreen Cemetery or, or Milton exactly. Cemetery? It kind of depended on where you were. That, that both coexisted at the same time okay. and still do today. Yes. We still have people being buried uh, in, in smaller family graveyards. Uh, Evergreen, our main city cemetery, Evergreen Cemetery started in 1874 um, and has been still in existence. Uh, so that was ongoing also. Mm -hmm. It kind of depended on where you were. Uh, okay. A lot of people wanted to be married on their farm or on their property. Sure. Some people in town obviously were going to be buried in the city cemetery. Mm -hmm. So there are over 800, you say, in, in, in the in Close the to 800. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Historical Society did their first survey of cemeteries uh, around 1970. Uh, Steve Kate started that initiative. Ernie Johns ran with it. Others helped. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, they documented roughly 763. And our endeavors over the past couple of years and, and taking what they had and running with it, we've met, we've met and found other people that showed us other cemeteries we didn't know about, uh, some what we call slave cemeteries on former mm -hmm. plantations, uh, and some just forgotten cemeteries. Would the advent of cremation have a lot to do with the need for more cemetery space? Uh, you know, that's, that's in, I'm not the expert on this I, I topic, understand. but I do see a trend in, in more people being cremated. Right. Uh, it's, it's, uh, my and friends in the funeral business tell me there's a higher and higher percentage every year. It right? seems like mm -hmm. it. And I think there's a, it, it costs less to cremate, my understanding, than to do a traditional burial. Um, and that gets outside of all the religious beliefs behind sure. either, either one. Sure. But, um, you know, so I, it's kind of like archives. I think cemeteries are always growing. We're always going to oh, need yeah, space. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. How about the, there's a, at least two churches I know of here that have uh, uh, locations in the buildings where you can uh, place your remains. Oh, wow. Uh, I did not know that. I, know, uh, I believe the Episcopal Church has that and okay. uh, maybe the United Methodist Church. Well, maybe they're starting a new trend. It may be. I don't know. <laughs> it may be just new to our community. Uh, yeah. Tell me about a typical request. Your young lady over here at the desk gets a phone call. What, what's the typical request or information they're seeking? That's a good question. So uh, our job is kind of 50-50. Okay. Uh, we keep all the permanent records and we have them back to 1804. So half of what we do is history. Okay. Uh, we get a lot of requests for local history, a lot of genealogists uh, all over the country and beyond that want to find, if they have family roots in Rutherford County, we can help them find the old marriage mm -hmm. records and prove their lineage kind of, uh, kind of questions. Um, we've done exhibit research uh, in collaboration with uh, Stones River Battlefield, mm -hmm. uh, Sam Davis Home, Oakland's, uh, others. Uh, but the other half of what we do is the more contemporary legal issues. So if somebody needs a copy of their, their divorce record from 20 years ago because they're filing for Social Security, we're able to retrieve those records if they're here and make the copies and get, and get them in their hands. Um, we do a lot with property records, especially around tax time. Mm -hmm. uh, people need to show or, 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 or know what they've paid on property taxes for the past 20 years. So we can assist with that, assist the trustee's office with the older records and pull those records and retrieve them. Um, and of course we deal with lawyers too that need to look at a court file sure. from years gone by so we can retrieve those records. Okay. If you had one request or one need you'd like to fulfill, what would that be? Uh, to help the citizens of Rutherford County more okay. and make them more knowledgeable of what we, what we have and how we can help them. Does that mean more staff or just Both. More, more publicity, <laughs> I guess? Both. Um, more we're hoping to grow the staff through, through the, obviously we're county government, so sure. we're, we're hoping the county can uh, help us out there a little bit in the, in the years to come to add a little more staff. As the county grows, the records grow, and our staff needs grow. Sure. I mean, it's a given. So we hope to add, add on to staff in the next few years. And then just to inform the citizens through endeavors like this, um, that we're here, that we've been here 10 years, and that we're here to, to help the citizens of Rutherford County by preserving their history, but also preserving their legal records, and, and, and we can help them retrieve those. Let's go back to your location again. You're on the, I guess, the former location of the Rutherford County Schools headquarters, fronting on Memorial. <laughs> That's right. But your so address is technically? We are at 435 Rice Street. Okay. We're a little connector street between Burton and the shopping center with Murfreesboro Athletic Club, okay. Goodwill, 
CC's Pizza, that shopping center fronts Memorial. So it is kind of hard to give people yeah. directions. Yeah. I always ask them if they're from Murfreesboro, they probably knew where the old school board was. Yeah, We're sure. right behind that old school board yeah. building on Memorial. Yeah, yeah. If they're newer to town, uh, everybody knows where the MAC is, Murfreesboro Athletic Club. Okay. For some reason, I guess, people work out, I don't. <laughs> so I say, we're right beside the Mac or Goodwill or CC's Pizza, um, so. John, one other question. I noticed a lot of photos around on display here from the community. Do you have a, a file or files on, uh, on photographic exhibits? Uh, great question. Uh, there again, our main job is the, the documents of gov uh, government uh, history mm -hmm. and, and, and legacies. But a couple of years ago, several years ago now, we had a wonderful opportunity, the county, to work with Shacklitz Photography on the Square. Okay. Uh, and if you're oh, from boy. here, you know Shacklitz. Well, and, and I've Mr. used the archives on so many presentations. Oh, oh yes, a lot of people do. Mr. Shacklitz passed away in 1994, but in his lifetime had collected over 30,000 negatives. Mm. He had taken photographs and collected photographs. And so we were able to work with Shacklitz, we still work with him now, sure. and to, to bring those, those historical images to the archives, to preserve them and make them available to the general public. And that was something that the county commission uh, allowed us to do and gave us the blessing to work on that initiative. So yes, we do have some photos on display and we have so many more on computer. Oh, I can imagine. And uh, people can come in and look at those photos at any time. We don't post a lot of that on the internet because of copyright issues, yeah. but we can definitely assist them in finding images uh, that they may need, mm -hmm. uh, especially for research um, for whatever initiative. And I think of a lot of great local photographers, Mr. Lee Lively, I bet you have photos from him, <sighs> Jimmy Carnahan, Mr. Leo yeah. Farrell. Exactly. Mm. You, you're from here. You know them all. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I knew several of them. Yeah, okay. But the collection does date as far back as the Civil War, believe it or not, and does uh, come up to the, almost the present. So it's a great collection that needs to be m more utilized. Absolutely. Well, John, we've enjoyed visiting with you at the Rutherford County Archives. This is fascinating work. You must enjoy coming to work every day. Love coming to work every day, and I love helping the people. Thank you. Well, great. Congratulations again. All right. We've been visiting with John Lodel, Rutherford County Archivist from the archives location right here on Rice Street in downtown Murfreesboro.